All righty. I think we've got a few people who are still jumping in, but in the interest of time, we can go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, so first and foremost, I just wanted to thank everybody for taking a few minutes out of their day to join uh, us for Data Theorem's live demo series. Um, before I introduce our speaker, though, I did want to just share, uh, we will reserve time at the end for uh, Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop those into the, uh, the WebEx chat window um, throughout the presentation as, as you think of them, and uh, we'll reserve some time at the end for that. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Doug Dewey, who will be our speaker today, and he'll be presenting on why stop AppSec data breaches. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Doug. All right, thanks, Richard. Um, assuming my audio is working okay, let's go ahead and jump into this. Uh, so, again, the title of this presentation is Why Stop AppSec Data Breaches, and we'll, we'll talk about it with some real-world examples, particularly one that was uh, sort of more famous these last couple of months around a, sort of an SDK privacy misuse uh, problem that, um, that, a, that a very large customer um, uh, had a problem with. So with that, we'll walk through the agenda and I uh, just want to make sure my slides are moving here. Uh, so on the agenda, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, the construction of what an AppSec data breach really is and so maybe define some of this terminology around what's a data breach, what's an AppSec data breach or application security data breach. And then we'll start looking at some real world examples. The good news is or the bad news, depending on how you look at it, is there are so many examples of these AppSec data breaches, application data breaches keep occurring, um, and they're sort of changing, particularly in the last two years. And then we'll zoom in a little bit about third-party trackers, um, and these trackers come in the form of oftentimes of software composition. So modern software is usually not built and written all by one company. It's a, an amalgamation of a variety of tools, open source libraries, software development kits, back-end API services, all these things are not only first-party software, but also third-party software. But part of that free, often free third-party software, there is a data exchange and it can lead to some tracking information and even data breach uh, implications uh, when you're not really paying attention to what these third-party um, software tools can do for a company. And then the last, we'll, we'll kind of, uh, pun intended, zoom in on the case study around Zoom. And, um, and we'll have some recommendations on how folks can move forward to, so that you might not end up in a headline um, and have a, some serious impact to sort of these kinds of AppSec data breaches. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and move forward. So, so this will be really quick. What is a data breach? If you're on this webinar, you probably understand what a data breach is, but it's always good to see what is a, a definition that you can find on the internet about um, what a data breach is. But ultimately, it's when an unauthorized party gets access to your data, where they copy it, transmit it, view it, steal it, use it. Anybody using information uh, that was sensitive to a party uh, in an unauthorized, unauthorized manner uh, could be viewed as a data breach. So that could be in the physical world, not just in the digital world. Um, but what we're seeing more often is when things like PII gets involved, uh, personally identifiable information, there could be legal implications to data breaches. And so from a legal construct and um, government fines and um, intellectual property loss, it really has a much bigger impact uh, when that kind of data breach occurs. So now let's look a little bit about AppSec. So why does an, uh, uh, when you look at application security, and we're gonna sort of talk about this term full stack application security. Um, we look at it really from the adversary's perspective. So when an unauthorized party or an attacker really wants to get access to data, and oftentimes the motivation is to monetize that data, um, they are just attacking the pure application presentation layer of the app. They're attacking every layer of the app. And the three major layers of a modern app is of course, what we used to call the client side or that presentation side, um, all of the embedded API calls from, from that client side all the way to the backend services. And then increasingly the backend services live in multi-cloud. Very rarely do they live in just one cloud infrastructure environment, um, but they're spread across a variety of them. And so we'll talk a little bit about this as we go through the full presentation, but this is just to ensure we have common terminology, full stack application security. And the context of this presentation is around data breaches that happen at that app layer. So here's the main problem, and this is sort of an analogy to think about. Um, if you look at the three layers, it's almost like an iceberg with, you know, the data sitting, you know, down below the surface. 
uh, the user experience layer with mobile and web, right? We're talking about Android and iOS, and then of course, things like single page applications, sort of these modern web applications, they look a lot different than what we, we've been dealing with over the last 20 years. And then um, the API is really the new transport layer. You know, in, the, in client server, the network was always the transport layer. Now APIs really become the dominant transport layer of where data is being uh, transmitted in, the, particularly in the millions of records perspective. So you could argue that if someone has lost over a million records, API is almost always involved now in the last two years. And then cloud, these are the building blocks of the application. These are a variety of different kinds of cloud services. It used to be traditional infrastructure, compute network storage. Now it looks a little bit different with microservices, serverless applications, cloud functions, the way that open source cloud databases are being used today, the way that cloud storage is being used. It's very different than what we've dealt with, again, even just 10 years ago. Um, so looking at these three layers, when you think about it, when an attacker is doing, they're attacking oftentimes that user experience layer where the human is interacting with the application. And their mission is really to get tokens, to get credentials, to get sessions. And from that, they can then utilize going after where a lot of the data flows, which is at the API layer. And if they can punch through that API layer, then what often occurs is the ability to extract the data, which is really where the financial motivation comes from, whether it comes out of cloud databases or cloud storage. So the big question really is, why should we even stop AppSec data breaches? And every great security person that I know who has to answer this question for their organization is, they often start about thinking about these two issues. What are the targets for attack and the risk associated for those um, attack targets or those attack vectors? And then how do you measure the impact? It's almost like going through um, an exercise, like a wargaming exercise that what if an attacker was able to get XYZ asset and what is the risk of that attack? What is, the, what is the probability that it could occur? And then what could be the impact to the company if that occurred? And in my view, the best security teams are really good at constantly asking this question and constantly going after these two areas of attack targets and impact and thinking about the threats and the risk associated with it. And so when you look at the headlines, you know, it almost feels like every month there's a major headline of another major company losing million plus records of their customers' information that they now have to disclose, they have to deal with lawsuits, et cetera. And um, sadly, you know, the way the attacks have been shifting, they've been heavily moving toward that kind of intersection layer between the traditional app and the backend infrastructure. And that API is one of the areas that continually gets attacked um, and exploited for massive amounts of data. And so we're gonna focus on just three of these examples. Um, Capital One, this company called 63 Red, which is sort of a political group uh, company. And the last is an Indian uh, payments app, a little bit like Paytm or PayPal, but in India, uh, it's a popular payments app. And so these are the three interesting examples to really kind of illustrate this concept of uh, AppSec data breach. So, uh, so let's, with the first one around Capital One, so this is sort of famous because the attacker uh, was so skilled. Her name was Paige Thompson. She was a very skilled um, attacker. And she started off going after that web layer. So going after uh, of vulnerabilities and exploits that she knew about on their open source web application firewall, their WAF by attacking essentially traditional web security infrastructure, she used that exploit to sort of punch through that first layer. And from there, then she started looking for issues around the API and, and leveraging an SS, SSRF, server-side request forgery attack, in order to further exploit the situation going, going to the next layer. And then lastly, she eventually found a compute node, an EC2 instance, that was using, I think, a dated metadata service. Uh, metadata service version one. And from there, she could really understand where the most interesting data could live in this environment. Um, and then, of course, she was able to start doing data extraction. I think, obviously, one of her big mistakes was, as an attacker, was to go out and start bragging about it publicly, and eventually law enforcement was able to catch up to her um, for, you know, sort of essentially bragging about, you know, all the things that she was able to do. But the point is, it's like, it was a multi-layer attack. This is a full-stack application security data breach. Um, and we'll see, we'll continue to see this 
as a trend and an example uh, when we look at you know how how these apps have been exploited. The next one is again this conservative uh, political website. People say it's like Yelp for conservatives. I don't know much about this to be honest about 63 Red, but one thing that we did learn is that looking at the research behind this attack, um, it was an exploit of looking at for an embedded password and source code. Uh, inside that JavaScript React native app. So JavaScript React is one of the most you know, new common frameworks for building modern web applications and oftentimes they would leverage to even help uh, build out the mobile presence as well. So in this case, they had an embedded password at the application layer. They used that to sort of do shadow API exploitation. So there were a bunch of APIs that you know, folks didn't know about, but then as you started to dig into the, the JavaScript, you started to figure out there's more embedded APIs uh, that didn't have that authentication protection. And then from there, uh, the backend cloud storage was breached in order to extract more data. And then in the case of BHIM, this uh, Indian payments mobile app, uh, they had an embedded Android token uh, inside that Android app. They used that to exploit the API, uh, taking advantage of that token. And then and ultimately there was an S3 buck, uh, bucket that stored PII data, very sensitive banking information of their of some of their customers and losing 7 million records of PII data uh, that were all pulled out of that Amazon S3 storage. So in each case, you know, if you look at the construction of the attack, it's multi-layered, right? The best attackers never focus on one layer of the application. They focus at, uh, they look for exploits at every layer of the application. And sometimes one layer unlocks the next layer uh, to sort of get to ultimately where you want to go, which is the data. Another area that we want to zoom in and talk about, and there'll be some good examples here, uh, the two big examples, um, is around the construction of how an app is built. So sometimes an app is built with first party code, um, it's code that your development team builds and publishes, but very rarely is it done without the assistance of other people's software. So whether that's open source, libraries, frameworks, software development kits, SDKs, and API services, all these things are often pulled into the app to enhance the app, and it can be for different reasons. Maybe you need to run analytics. Maybe you need to leverage uh, pre-built databases. Maybe you uh, want different kinds of utilities that make the app run better. You have to do single sign-on, performance measurement, um, licensing, social media, single sign-on authentication. There's a lot of reasons why these third-party code is, is added into your application, but it leaves a tracking mechanism also inside that app. And sometimes the trade-off, if you read the fine print of how these SDKs sort of monetize or, or make money because they're often backed by really large corporations, is that we will give you this software for free, but the trade-off is we needed some of your exhaust data, some of your session data in order to be able to make our ongoing development of this utility useful for our business so that we collect more data. And look, some of the best companies in the world are creating huge advantages by having a data advantage. Um, and so if we look at the Ring doorbell, um, you know, again, Ring is owned by a very large corporation that is good at leveraging data. Um, we started to figure out that the Ring doorbell uh, uh, app on Android uh, was tracking all kinds of PII information. Um, whether that was intended or accidental or there was a mistake or how the implementation occurs, at the end of the day, this, this, is a, um, this is a trend that we continue to see with third-party software. And sometimes the third-party software is very open, very clear that they are going to do this. They are going to extract data as, far, as part of the trade for giving you free software, uh, which leads to sort of this concept of this case study on Zoom. Um, they had a third party SDK that led to a data privacy exploit um, and it had some serious implications in the two, two basically the two, two and a half weeks of time period that occurred when um, all of this information was coming out. And so, so it all sort of triggered off on March 26 um, when uh, it was disclosed that the Zoom iPhone app uh, or iOS app uh, was sending data to Facebook uh, irrespective of whether or not you were authenticating in with Facebook. Um, and so that was the event SDK and that created a, you know, obviously a lot of problems. Uh, and at a minimum, it created PR problems for Zoom because at the end of the day, they were, 
they were leveraging the fact that we were under quarantine. Many organizations needed better ways to connect and collaborate with video. School systems were starting to use it. Businesses were starting to use it of all sizes. Church or religious organizations were starting to use it. And so they were getting this huge lift in attention and even in valuation in the public markets being tra a publicly traded company because of this. Uh, but this was sort of a, neg a very negative headline, um, which really, you know, started, if you look at March 23, they had hit an all-time high in their stock price, knowing that all the quarantine lockdowns were occurring. And then on the 26th, um, this information came out about the Facebook SDK uh, sending information um, on iPhone. And then the next day, Zoom responded by removing the SDK data collection feature in that app. Um, and then researchers started to come out even further, folks from the NSA started to say, hey, look, there's other marketing problems here or, or lack of disclosure problems here. You know, the Zoom marketing claim they were doing end-to-end -end encryption, uh, but it appears maybe not the case. And so, um, so from these two major security issues or, or privacy issues, um, a, a variety of class action lawsuits started coming, particularly at the U.S. state level and at international levels, countries around the world were starting to file lawsuits against the company. Um, and then big businesses like Google and SpaceX started making like corporate-wide bans on the use of Zoom. Um, and then, uh, you know, the hits keep coming. So then an automated tool started to show up uh, out on, with security researchers, which made it much easier to find eligible Zoom meetings that you could do quote-unquote Zoom bombing on. You could jump in on a Zoom meeting and take, o take it over or hijack it. And so these are things that were just, you know, religious organizations were seeing, you know, their meetings – uh, being taken over by folks with, you know, with ill intent. And so the point of it is, was uh, it was a pretty rough two weeks for Zoom, and the founder CEO of the company just started going on a public apology tour and sort of committing that security was going to be the number one priority of the company moving forward. Um, and, you know, during that time period, you really saw the impact of, of investors, of people who were betting on the company, and you know, from March 23rd through April 7th, you saw a $12.8 billion uh, loss in market cap, which is about 29% of their stock value. So that's rough. That's a pretty rough two weeks to deal with headlines on security and privacy, uh, frankly, because of it's all sort of triggered by a third-party SDK. And so to go back to that original question, what is the cost and impact of an AppSec data breach? Well, in this particular case, it was pretty significant, right? you know, large amounts of market cap loss, um, lots of lawsuits, not only in the U.S., but around the world, public bans against your company and your and against your company's technology from political leaders, government leaders, high-profile customers. And then just sort of the, this one's probably the hardest one to measure, but your brand and reputation, right? How, how long will it take to sort of improve that when a mistake like this occurs? Um, I think the good news is, at least on market cap, you know, Zoom has really bounced back over the last few months. Um, and I, I would say, look, when you can automate and really commit to building a stronger AppSec program, you can turn some of these negative events um, into a much more positive outcome. I and mean, we really believe it's never too late to invest in your app, application security program. And we've been very fortunate um, to work with some really great companies over the years in this area. So that's really our, our strongest recommendation is uh, whether you're working with Data Theorem or you're working with other companies or a variety of companies uh, who really help with automating application security is, you know, go after sort of that full stack application security program um, and really identify those targets and risks and to help. And so again, we've been very fortunate to work with some of the best in the world who really are um, strongly committed to protecting data and protecting their customers' privacy. And, and we work really hard um, to be the best partner we can for these kinds of customers. And, um, and so just, you know, small highlight about Data Theorem. You know, we've been around since 2013. You know, our leadership team has been in the security industry for more than 15 years. And we've been lucky enough to be associated with some really interesting and good, good companies who've contributed to the industry. And we continue to get awards and get recognized for, what, for our work. Uh, and for our technology. And so if you would be interested in learning more about how maybe Data Theorem can help you, we recommend first to request and sign up for a demo and send us an email um, if you want some additional information.
So with that, uh, thank you for the time. And I think Richard wanted to open it up for some Q&A. Yeah, no, thank you, Doug. Very, uh, very good, informative uh, presentation. So um, I do have uh, two questions. Um, and the first is, uh, are there positive things that come out of a data breach? Uh, yeah, it's, it, you, know, um, you know, I'm not sure if we could ask Zoom or, or any of these other customers who've been in the headlines. But generally, uh, once the dust starts to settle from the, you know, you're going to go through hard times when you go through a high profile data breach. Uh, but when you get at, when the dust starts to settle from that data breach and you're not in the headlines as often, um, the leadership organizations typically of these companies really get a wake up call on how important security is. And so it goes from sort of being a, a potentially a tactical cost issue to a strategic issue that's associated with the brand and the trust of the company. And so for the most positive thing that tends to happen is, is not just attention, but resources and funding. So if you get a, if you can step, if you can sort of survive that um, that rocky time during the during immediately during the breach, on the other side of it, you will often have more money, more funding, more support to really put together um, a much better security program going forward. And, and that's a, that's an important emphasis that we always have here at Data Theorem is it's not just about tools and about people; it's really about putting the whole program together. That sort of like even if when people leave or tools change, you have this program that's more sustaining. So being able to build your program is oftentimes easier after a major breach. And I would argue you'd wanna do it uh, after one of your competitors or one of your uh, industry partners has a breach. And you get, you, that way you get to benefit from someone else's unfortunate misfortune. Um, and so that, that's another way to look at, you know, uh, if you're like, for example, if you're in the video communication space, Zoom having gone through that should make it much easier for most video communication companies to really rally uh, and build a great program. So. Thank you. Um, and then uh, one other question is, um, could data theorem have prevented the data breaches that you outlined in your examples? Um, you know, look, any security company or vendor who thinks their technology is so superior that it could stop every and prevent every single data breach that's ever been out there is uh, it's either either that's hubris or they haven't been in the industry long enough, right? And so the issue with attackers is it's asymmetric warfare, right? The attacker has to get it right once, the defender has to get it right every single time. Um, and in asymmetric warfare, the the advantages are so heavily stacked toward the attackers benefit. And if the attacker is highly sophisticated and motivated and skilled, in the case of Paige Thompson, right, it's not like Capital One doesn't have a good security team. Capital One has a great security team and they have, you know, invested in a lot of different tools. And so, um, so we think in some of those situations, we would, would have done a good job of identifying issues early and really, and we know that we would have banged the table hard that certain things need to be fixed and corrected um, sooner. Um, but in the end, there, there are no perfect vendors and there's no perfect technologies to stop every type of attack. Um, but I don't think that's sort of um, the, the point. The, the, the most important point is like, again, committing to a program, committing to being both resilient and responsive in the face of these adversities. And when these adversities happen, how do you handle them will often be the difference between a massive crater and market cap and value and trust and brand damage and something that you can live through and respond well from. And we've seen both of those types of examples. And so, uh, again, no, Data Theorem would have not stopped every single one of those attacks, um, but we would have, we could have helped in many, many of those situations now that we've been able to analyze it because um, it's always easier to money more quarterback and figure out like what, what could have been done better. Well, thank you, Doug. Um, I don't see any other questions here in the chat. So um, I think with that, we can uh, wrap up uh, this week's live demo. And I appreciate, Doug, you coming on and speaking to us about uh, why to stop access data breaches. Um, and so, again, just as a reminder, if anybody's interested, um, you can go to www.datatherum.com slash demo to request a demo. Uh, and then, obviously, we, we, if you have any other further questions, you can send them to info at datatherum.com, and we'd be happy to get that answered. 
Uh, thank you again for taking some time to join us and we look forward to having you join us on our future uh, weekly uh, demo sessions. Thank you.